Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. So tonight we have with us a transportation coordinator. His name is Michael Parati. Welcome to the show, Michael Parati. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. So let's just jump right in and let's start with how did you get started in the business? Um, well, my mom and my dad were both uh, transportation coordinators. My mom was the first uh, female transportation coordinator in the Teamsters. So I started working with her pretty much a year or two after high school and was just a driver to start out. And then um, in the mid-90s, I branched out to a few other coordinators and started working for them and then became a transportation captain. Oh, wow. And eventually moved up to coordinating uh, and have been coordinating ever since. Okay, so what's a transportation captain? Transportation captain is my right hand. He is the guy who runs the drivers on set. He's the one who everybody goes to. All the departments go to him for runs. He's pretty much the go-to guy on the daily operations on set. Okay. And then I, as the coordinator, I'm the one that all the department heads deal with above him. So... Anything logistically, anything that needs to be ordered, all the managerial things, that's what I do. Okay. And then, of course, I can always trump any decisions that my captain makes that I think are bad. (laughs) And that's a good place to be. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So now, what was your first movie, the very first thing that you did, and then the first thing you did as a captain, and the first thing you did as a coordinator? The very first thing I worked on as a driver, I think it was a movie called All Men. It was a TV movie with Charlton Heston. I think it was in 1988. Um, It was Charlton Heston and Peter Strauss. That was my first driving gig. I was 20. And then uh, um, my first captaining job was a movie called Amnesia, a little independent feature. And that was like 95 or 96. And my first coordinating job was a movie called God's Lonely Man, which was another little indie project in 96 as well. During all this time, did you ever switch out and work in any other departments or did you stay strictly in the transportation department? I stayed in transportation. I I started there and and that's where I stayed. I had thought about going into locations Mm -hmm. uh, for a minute until I walked a mile in their shoes (laughs) and I said, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So now tell us, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, what your job is like? What's a typical day as a coordinator? My day is planning the next day and the next three days. So I'm always working a day or two ahead of schedule, ordering equipment if we're going out on location, if uh, the grips or the electricians need condors or scissor lifts, I have to order all that, hiring drivers to drive all the equipment, hiring any additional labor, any additional equipment, truck, you know, finding picture cars, having meetings with the directors to figure out what cars they want to use in the shows. It's paperwork, it's budgeting, it's phone calls, and it it makes the day go by really fast. And is that now what now your structure? Now, you did say that there were drivers and there's a captain. Um, who else is in your department? Do you have people like in an office that you work with as well, like your own little department? You know, I don't. I know a lot of the guys who work on the bigger budget stuff, they get like a full staff mm. um, because I really work in the independent world, mostly independent features uh, okay. with lower budget stuff that's under $10 million. So they don't have the luxury of giving me the staff that I would normally require. Mm. So I end up having to do most of the work. I do have, uh, because the Department of Transportation has become very strict on the rules being implemented, I do have now, working for me, a a girl who takes care of all of our DOT requirements, make sure that all the drivers are legal to be driving, that their their driver's licenses are not um, in any way suspended, that their Mm -hmm. medical cards are current, that their, you know, all all of their stuff is up to date. Okay, so So she does all the checking, the background checking. Yeah, she she does all the stuff that would pertain to the Department of Transportation. And then um, I pretty much do everything else. A lot of guys have dispatchers. They have office people to do purchase orders. They have picture car coordinators that find all the cars that you see in the movies or the TV shows. I have to do everything. So you're doing a lot more than a regular transportation coordinator would do. Yeah, I mean, 
I do because I'm on those size budget shows. You know, I don't have the uh, I don't have the luxury that some of these guys have. As far as like what you do, do you have your own vehicles, or depending on the project that you do, the the people that hire you, do they bring in the the transportation vehicles and all that stuff? No, my job as the coordinator is to find and rent all of the equipment, anything with a steering wheel and an engine. Mm -hmm. I am responsible for for hiring and renting and uh, maintaining um that, that all falls under my job okay as coordinator suggests you're coordinating all this but do you do any of the driving or are you strictly just in charge of everyone and you tell people what to do and you have other drivers yeah the uh, the union doesn't allow coordinators to drive oh. we are exempt from driving so if i was listed as a transportation captain which a lot of people will do um shows that can't afford to have a person who isn't driving as well they will give you the title of transportation captain you do the job of the coordinator but it gives you the ability to drive something if for some reason they get into a pinch or a driver gets sick you can jump into a truck at that point and drive it you're legal oh okay under the title of coordinator i can't get in a truck and drive it mm -hmm. under the title of captain i can aha uh -huh. okay now here's Here's a question. You know, some shows have product placement and they use certain cars. How does that work? Are you just told like, okay, you need to get a Honda for this shot or you need to get a Ferrari? Generally, I will have a picture car meeting with the director mm -hmm. and kind of pick his brain and we'll do an overall scope of the show to see what he's thinking for the characters. And then I can go out to, again, it depends on the script. If the script is subject matter that is not favorable, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to get product placement. If it's mm -hmm. a happy love story, um, everybody wants to give you cards. So, for example, oh, really? on Teen Wolf, yeah, on Teen Wolf, um, Toyota is our sponsor, oh. and they give us everything under the moon. I mean, we ask and we get it. Wow. And they, yeah, they in turn get, you know, the advertising, the, the, they get the celebrities in the cars, and um, you know, it might spark uh, an interest in a high school or college kid that watches the show to say, oh, well, Lydia drives a Prius. I want a Prius, you know? Okay. So it's great when you can get it because especially on the high-end stuff, like Ferraris, um, a lot of times you'll do a, a nightclub scene or a big mansion in Beverly Hills and they want some really high-end stuff. And you can reach out to a lot of the higher-end vendors and they generally will be uh, on board with stuff to just kind of place in there. Is it like that with every job that you do that um, people will want their cars in there? Or is it just like you said, some of the bigger or the happier teenage kind of films? Or like, for instance, let's say dramas or horror films or cop shows? It really depends on the show. Um, I just did, uh, we did a pilot for MTV for a new series on Scream okay. that they're turning into a TV series. Oh. And I went out to try to get some product placement, but because it was teenagers getting murdered, um, mm -hmm. a lot of people weren't really jumping on board. Yeah. But we did get, um, I have a really good relationship with Porsche, and they gave us uh, three cars to put just in a garage, and, and nobody got murdered in the cars, but it was supposed to be a high-end party, and they wanted three matching, three vehicles from the same line. So my Porsche reps were like, we'll give you the cars. So other than that, though, I couldn't get anything product placed for that show. So I had to end up renting stuff. Here's a question. Like, you know when you have to hire extras, and then sometimes you say, okay, what kind of car does the extra have? And you use the, the extra's cars. Does that fall mm -hmm. under what you do? Like finding out what, like saying, okay, we need some extras that have a Toyota or that have a, a you know, Camaro or something. Generally... I will find anything that's a principal vehicle or is a featured vehicle, I will find, whether it be a new car or an old car. There are, there are vendors, all they do is deal with picture cars. My, my main vendor is Studio Picture Vehicles, and they have hundreds of cars. And I can call him up and say, hey, I need a 1958 whatever. And yeah. he'll send me pictures, and I show them to the director. When the extras bring cars, generally... We just put it out with the, the, the casting people that do the extras mm -hmm. casting. And right. we say, hey, we're doing a, like I did that movie Job a couple years ago with Ashton Kutcher. Mm -hmm. um, and that was supposed to be set in the 70s. So I worked very closely with the extras casting people 
and said, listen, we need 1970, we need to fill the streets and parking lots with 1970s vehicles, but I don't mm-hmm. want them all to be 280Zs or, you know, right. Right. VW Bugs. So they'll send me pictures. I have a little bit of freedom to pick some of the stuff. But when it's going to be something featured, it'll always get run past the director. It must be fun to do like the the nice old vintage cars, like the 65 Mustangs and then the T-Birds and all those kind of cars. It's fun. And at the same time, um, it's a little more challenging because those cars, they overheat very quickly. If you're mm. working in the summer and you have them driving back and forth through camera on more than one occasion, you'll have one that overheats or breaks down. and And it becomes kind of a headache, you know, and then the owner of the car saying, you ruined my car and you're going to pay to fix it. And so honestly, picture cars are my biggest headache. There are guys that all they do is picture cars. Um, uh, If you watch credits on some of the big movies like Fast and the Furious, you'll see there's a a, a credit for a guy called the picture car coordinator. And all he does is deal with those cars. He finds them, he rents them, he schedules them. I don't have to think about it. Unfortunately, in my indie world, I do it all. Now, have you ever decided to go outside of the indie films and, and do bigger ones? You know, it's not really my choice. Um, <laughs> I send my resume, but, you know, when you're dealing with the studios, they have their studio system. They have their the guys that, you know, kind of work their way up within the studios. A lot of the mm-hmm. people at Warner Brothers and Universal, they're guys that work on the lot. And then, you know, they kind of move up in the ranks at the lot. So okay. it's difficult. The only way that, that I would have my opportunity would be if, if one of my production managers was to land a, a big show, and then they would bring me on. But I like I do like my indie world because it gives me a lot of freedom. There's not a lot of big brother, so it makes the job a lot easier and a lot more fun. Are you also responsible for choosing the vehicles that the characters should drive? The director will tell me, you know, okay. I'm thinking that they would drive a muscle car, but they may not get specific. So then okay. I'll bring them eight or 10 choices of muscle cars. And they'll go, I like this one. I like the lines, but I don't like the color. And then I'll mm-hmm. see if I can find it in a different color so we don't have to paint it. Because every, every time you need to change something on it, it costs money. So my mm-hmm. job is to, I've got to do it within my budget. Um, you know, that's the thing. When you work on these smaller projects, you have to work a little harder because you can't just throw money and make the problem go away. You have mm-hmm. to actually make it work within your budget. So, you know, that's one of the aspects I really like is it's a challenge. It's not, you know, oh, well, just I need $20,000 more. You know, I have mm. to I have to actually make it work. Now, how about um, stunt drivers and cars that get blown up or, you know, damaged? How does that work? I don't hire the stunt drivers, um, but we will pick the cars that we're going to use in the stunt. Um, generally, if they're going to be involved in a crash or something or a rollover, we have to get them to the special effects shop special effects will weld in the cage and all that stuff. Um, mm. My vendor will, you know, do the emergency brake cable and, and uh, you know, do a, a safety check on it just to make sure that it's going to perform the way it should. Um, mm-hmm. Generally, we pick up tanks and we put in a, a one-gallon fuel cell, so there's very little gas in the cars. There's a bunch of legalities that you get into if you're putting a car into, like, the L.A. Harbor it's got to have no engine. All the fluids have to be drained out of it. So what you end up doing is you have one vehicle that's good and then one that's just a shell. And that's okay. the one that, that they do the stunt with. So you have doubles and triples. And, and sometimes you back into it, meaning like sometimes I'll find a car that's already messed up mm-hmm. and see if the director likes that. And then I can go, you know, it's easier for me to find a clean car that matches a, a messed up car than it is to go the other way. If I showed him a bunch of vehicles and he says, oh, I like that Navigator, well, now I've got to try to find a matched up Navigator if we don't have Mm. the budget to do it practically. Because a lot Mm. of times they'll cut to the car being flipped over already. So Mm -hmm. you can get away with finding a car that's already been smashed and you just put a forklift out there and flip it over and no one's the wiser. So tell me, what would be the hardest thing that you have to do in your position? We just talked about the cars, which is, you know, kind of a difficult thing, like you were just saying. But is there any, is that like the hardest thing that you run into in your job as a coordinator? Or are there other things that, that people wouldn't think would be a pain in the butt, like maybe paperwork or licensings or permits or something right. like that? Honestly, the hardest thing for me is coming in on budget. Because when I do a budget for a project, 
I know, you know, the equipment costs are fixed. Trailers cost what they cost. Star trailers are what they are. Everything has a fixed rental price. But mm-hmm. labor, I never know how long we're going to shoot. You know, mm-hmm. I can yeah. budget the drivers to work a 14 hour day and production shoots for 20 hours. So the hardest part for me is to, to stay within my budget. And really the only way I can do that is, um, you know, you have the bad days and you have the good days. You have the days where the drivers will work 18 hours and then, you know, I'll cut them loose at 12 another day to try to make up for the overtime. That's my biggest challenge is stay on budget because okay. the labor just, I just never know. Okay. So you then, your department takes, your budget includes the labor hours for the men. But now does that also include the cars? I have a line in my budget for everything. I have in my budget, there's all the labor rates. There's the star trailer rate, all of the equipment rates, the picture car rate. I have usually a pad for like picture cars and allowance. And then all the, the little stuff that you don't think about, you know, toilet paper, paper towels, soap, all the stuff for the actors' trailers, stock them and cleaning supplies, all that stuff. Anything that has to do with, with their trailers, I have to have in my budget. How about the turnaround time for the drivers? Like how long in between do you, do you get <sighs> for them? Not enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> drivers are regulated at eight hours. We have to be off for eight hours. Now, okay. Department of Transportation says you, can know, you can't work more than a 12-hour day as a truck driver. But oh, okay. we are a gray area because we're not driving like cross-country truck drivers. They're driving nonstop. We mm. drive from point A to point B. It might take us an hour and a half to get there. And then the truck sit until we finish shooting that day. And then the guys get back into the truck and move it to the next location. So okay. when they do their log sheet for the Department of Transportation, they have to show, you know, off duty, not driving. They, they have to make it so that they're, that they're not actually driving the whole thing. So during that time, though, they could be resting and taking naps and stuff. I mean, so it's not like they're going to be tired if it goes longer and then you have to deal with, okay, are they safe to drive or do they have to well, awake the it, whole time? I mean, it's, we, we have the least amount of turnaround uh-huh. and we are responsible for the heaviest pieces of equipment on the crew. We are in three hours usually before crew call mm-hmm. because we have to pull in, park, set up. I mean, we're basically, we're setting up and breaking down a circuit every day. Yeah. So, you know, production is budgeted normally at 12 or 13 hours of filming. And then we have our three hours before and usually our three hours after. So we're usually doing 17 to 18 hours a day. We're, we're just, and our eight hours off is not necessarily sleeping. It's mm-hmm. eight hours like, okay, guys, you're leaving the studio now. But some of these guys, you know, live an hour away. Mm-hmm. They get home, they shower. So they're getting like five hours of sleep. Okay. So. There are the days when we're on stage, like Teen Wolf, for example, because we're a werewolf show, we shoot a lot of night. But we usually are on stage five days an episode. Five out of seven days, we're on stage. So the guys can take advantage of being on stage and not having to move around. But during the day, we have runs. You know, camera needs the camera package picked up. My guys get in the truck and go get it. Mm-hmm. Grips need stuff picked up. Electric, wardrobe. All the departments that need anything done, it, it, as simple as uh, we need band-aids for the, for, for the medic, we okay. go and do that run. So, again, and on, on my budget shows, I don't have a big crew. So yeah. I have four full-time drivers with me on Teen Wolf, four, four stake bed drivers that do the run, which isn't a lot. Now, do you ever get anybody saying that, that the Teamsters are lazy? Oh, yeah. And do yeah, they even of, realize? Do they even realize what they do? You know, my standard answer is everybody picks their department. You know, if you're not happy being a grip or an electrician, go get your class A, get randomly drug tested like we do, and be a driver. You know, yeah. I mean, it's so easy for everybody to point their finger, but it's like everybody has everything they need every day. Who do you think picks that stuff up? You know. Yeah. I've heard it since I started in the business. So I think it's getting a little bit better. But when I started in the industry in the 80s, mm-hmm. the Teamsters did not have the best reputation. But, you know, I, I'm doing my part to, to kind of change that as much as I can. But it, it, my, it's still upsetting. My question is, why would they say that? I think it's just jealousy, a lot of it, because they're standing on set. They're inside. We're outside. You know, the, they've got to be on set. 
We don't. We can be sitting in our truck. Our job is to be ready to go on a run. So if there's an hour between runs and the guys want to sit in their truck and, you know, play with their Game Boy or whatever, I mean, we're on standby. Well, the thing is, is that's what their job is. Their job is a driver. So it has nothing to do with what the other crew members do inside or whatever their job is. And that's the, like you said, that's the job that they right. pick. So that's just, that's strange to me that um, they would say that about one group of workers when they, they should know what their job is. They're right. a driver. So that's, they're only responsible for the driving and what their, their job entails. So if they do have downtime, that's, that's their business. Right. Not right. No, trust me. I agree with you. <laughs> You know, I think I run into it more, though, honestly, you run into it more when um, when you have a lot of drivers on a show and everybody's kind of in the same area. A lot of times when you're I'll use like if you're doing a Western, for example, generally, when you do a Western, everything is together because camera angles on a Western, they see in every direction. So you'll always have one big base camp with the work trucks and the cast trailers. Everything is in one spot. And. You'll generally have a lot of drivers on shows like that because they're bigger budgets and the union wants you to carry a full crew. So the other departments will see the drivers sitting around while they're going back and forth, you know, to their truck, getting stuff. I think, I think it just boils down to that our job isn't as labor intensive. Like we're not physical, like the grips yeah. and the electrician, they're, you know, humping cable and the carts and, you know, the C stands and all that stuff. We're not physical like they are. We're the guy in the truck driving them in the state bed to their 48-footer to load and then driving it back. But that's our job right. is just to drive that truck back and forth. And I think that they're outside in the heat. We're in the air-conditioned cab. They're, you know, it's it just, but you choose your department. <laughs> yeah, that's what your job is. And yeah. you guys have to deal with traffic. And you have to deal with being careful that someone, you don't get into an accident. You have to know what the roads are like. I mean, that's your position. Right. So now, do you interact with the cast much? Do you have to, like, talk to them or do anything with them? I generally will go and introduce myself at the beginning of each show um, because I am the the head of the department, and I want them to know that if there's anything that they need for their trailer, uh, if they're, you know, hey, if the stuff's not getting done or the captain's not taking care of me, who they can go to. Teen Wolf is a different um, is a different thing because we've been together for going on two years now, and and the kids are just great. Um, and you know, I saw I went to visit uh, some of my drivers were working on a show, and one of our actors was in it. And like oh. he saw me across the parking lot, and he came over and gave me a hug, and you know, how you doing? And so it's it's kind of that environment. And I think because they're younger actors, they're a little mm-hmm. more friendly and. Um, it's just more of a family environment on Teen Wolf. It's okay. not really like anything I've ever experienced. Um, nice. But I walked into the show, you know, seasons one and two were in Atlanta. So when it came to L.A. on season three, that's when I started. So the kids had all been working together with the costume designer and the makeup, uh, makeup and hair people for two years already. So when it came back to L.A., there was already that the family. And then they just embraced mm-hmm all the people that the executive producer Joe has assembled in LA, they just embraced everybody as part of the family. So, so the short answer is yes. I interact okay. with the actors. <laughs> how about, because you're doing the trailers, how is it with the other departments such as makeup and grooming, makeup and hair and um, wardrobe? Cause you're, mm-hmm. you're supplying their trailers as right as Correct. well, right? Yeah. Okay. We supply, I, I rent their trailers for them. Makeup and hair is very hard to please. They, <laughs> and I don't mean that. I don't mean that in any sort of disrespectful way. But every makeup and hair person has different needs, um, and and they vary on every show. Some makeup and hair people want more cabinet storage. Some want more drawer storage. You can never please everybody. So that's a, always a battle for me when I start a show. Is the kind of trailer I get makeup and hair. Wardrobe's easy because they just need a as much rack space as they can get with as much hanging space and a washer and dryer. So um, wardrobe is pretty easy to keep happy. Make it a little harder. 
Yeah, I th- because it, I guess it also depends on what they're doing. If they need special effects makeup, if they need right, especially Teen Wolf. We have two trailers. We have one that's just for special effects makeup and hair, and then one that's for uh, first unit makeup and hair. Um, and they want, you know, they've already talked to me about getting in a, a different kind of trailer for them for next season, but we just don't have it in the budget. That's that's the problem I run into is these trailers can get very expensive on rentals. And um, on a show like Teen Wolf, we, mm-hmm. we're very limited on our budget. It's a really good budget. So, you know, but what they have in L.A. is much better than what they have in Atlanta. And so that's what my producers always say. Well, you know, you, you're, you're 10 times better off than you were in Atlanta, so make it work. <laughs> now, something intrigued me, which I like. There was a washer and dryer on the other tra- on the other trailer. Yeah, uh, the wardrobe tra- the wardrobe trailer has a washer and dryer, so they can be doing laundry. Um, if they need to age garments down, if they need to dye stuff, they can do it all right there on their trailer. Nice. So where does it hook up to? Um, it's all it's all um, self. It's like a household washer and dryer, and it, and it, the the actual trailer has a big holding tank. Oh. So it drains into the holding tank, and we have a pumper truck that comes in pumps every couple days all the septic all the toilets and um everything out of all the trailers so now that's like really cool for me but um what was the longest day you've ever had on a show the longest day i've had on a show i mean for me as the coordinator they're never horribly long because i can kind of come and go as i please i generally will i usually do about a 14 hour day there's a lot of coordinators that don't but my feeling is they're paying me. I need to be there. There are some coordinators that don't have that kind of motto. They're golfing or, you know, they clock out at, they clock out at five because they have families, which I get, but you know, I'm single. I don't have kids. So I'm just, I love what I do though. So I, I love being on set. I always have. And, um, so my longest day as a coordinator is probably 15, 16. Okay. I worked on a movie where my drivers did a 28 hour day. It was the last day of filming and they filmed all night and the sun came up and they ripped built the tent around the gas station and they continued filming until about noon. And then we had to return equipment Wow! because it was the last day of the show. So it was, uh, it was a crazy, crazy day. We still talk about that day. <laughs> wow. How did you stay awake the whole time? Or did you guys take turns taking a nap? Well, the nice thing with that location was there was no picture cars. It was at a gas station, um, so the guys could sleep. Oh, okay. The nice thing about when we do night, uh, if we don't have picture cars and we're just in one location, sometimes like they'll do nightclubs, mm-hmm. and it'll be an all-nighter and it's an interior, my guys can sleep all night, oh, okay. you know, because there's really no runs. None of the vendors are open after 5 or 6 p.m. So we kind of enjoy night shoots from a transportation standpoint mm-hmm. because it means that that's the time that the guys will get to catch up on their sleep. But when we have picture cars and stuff like that, it's a different scenario because my guys have to stand by the picture cars, move them, camera. Um, That's part of their job as well. Now, do you ever get a little nervous handing over a a really nice picture car to the actor to drive on camera? Um, No, honestly, you know, they're insured. Okay. And they generally, they won't do any of the fast driving. It's always stunts that does the fast driving. You will have the occasional actor who thinks that he's Shakespeare and decides at the last minute to change the blocking Mm. and does his own thing that the director hasn't called for. That happened to me on a show. We had a Ferrari and, uh, and the actor decided he was going to jump out the back seat. It was convertible. And he was, instead of going out the door, he was going to jump backwards and slide off the (gasps) trunk and he done. And he dented it. Oh, no. And, yeah. And we all just kind of looked at each other. like So things like that, that makes your day. But you have insurance, you know. But it's just it's something that could have been avoided. And that's, that's the one thing for me that I hate is when stupid things happen. Oh, my gosh. You to know? a Ferrari, too. It couldn't have been to, like, a Prius or, or you know, like a, an American, you know, car right. where it's cheaper. Just an, an everyday. Yeah. <laughs> And, that, and that's usually, honestly, that's when it happens. It's when you have those high-end exotic cars Ugh. that people get stupid. And they think, oh, well, my character would, you know, would do this. And, you know, your character would respect this $200,000 car. Right. And he would get out of it like a normal human being. You okay. Know? 
Um, so, you know, you've been in this business, your family's been in this business all, all this time. How have you seen the industry change? Have there been many changes or technologies or, or stuff that, that's different than when you first started out? Well, um, I mean, definitely technology has helped us, like we were talking about with the Thomas Guides and, and getting around town, you know, yeah. now having GPS and stuff, cell phones, obviously. Yeah. You know, when I started, it was beepers. And uh, and you had to pull over to a payphone. <laughs> you had to find a payphone if somebody paged you. And um, so, <laughs> you know, in in the Department of Transportation, having GPS and having cell phones is a huge, huge benefit. Um, mm-hmm. The thing that I've really seen change is just the budgets have gotten tighter. Um, they're not spending money as easily. It it just you know it makes it challenges me a little bit more, but. I welcome the challenge. I, that's one of the things that I really like is trying to figure it out. You know, hey, I don't have the money to do it, so how am I going to get it done? Are the budgets better, like in Atlanta, or you know, in another state? No, you know, I think. Um, well, I mean, a ten million dollar budget in Atlanta when they're getting a thirty percent rebate is a seven million dollar budget. So they're definitely mm-hmm. um, there are some you know definite tax advantages to not being in LA. But now that we've passed the uh, the legislature for the 350 million that we're going to start getting next year, I think that a lot of these productions that have left LA are going to be coming back, mm-hmm. which will be great. You know, uh, I think uh, a lot of my producers have been out of town um, and they can't take me because I'm not rebatable. So mm-hmm. there are transportation coordinators that left LA back in you know the early 2000s when the business started to boom and. Louisiana and Atlanta and New Mexico, right? And they all work as locals. But I, I think that the overall movie making has—it's just. I think it was more fun twenty years ago. It's become more about business, and that's kind of a bummer because it used to be. Maybe it was just I was more creative. Yeah, I was really fortunate when I started out. I mean, my mom worked for this production company. They back in the eighties, they pumped out like every TV movie you saw. And, um, my mom did all of them. So they were like family, the executive producers and, and their kids. And, you know, we all kind of grew up on set together. And I think that that's kind of my memory of working in production. So when I get on these shows where you can tell it's just about the dollar and it's business and it takes a little bit away from it, a little bit of the Mm -hmm. fun, but I always try to add my own fun. So, so now, what would you suggest to someone who's just starting out and they want your job after listening to this interview, and they say that's kind of cool? I want to be a coordinator. What would you suggest? Don't do them? it. No, <laughs> run, <laughs> run away. <laughs> um, you know, I absolutely. I mean, I said it to you before. I I really do love what I do, and I would say if anybody's fortunate enough to do what I do, uh, more power to them. I have, uh, I've given a lot of people help. I've given people budgets, you know, guys that are, Hey, I got my a, a call to coordinate. Can you help me? Absolutely. You know, I'm not one of those guys that's like, no, why am I going to help you? You're going to be my competition. You know, um, yeah. you just got to learn it. You got to learn everything. Um, you have to know, I think you really need to know the business. I don't claim to be a mechanic. I don't claim to know how to change my own oil. Um, to be a, to be a transportation coordinator isn't really about that. It's about being able to manage people, being able to budget, being able to talk to people and have social skills. And, you know, I mean, that's what it is. You're dealing with 80 egos every day. So, you know, yeah. I don't care if you can change oil. Can you talk to people? Can you manage people? Can you, can you manage a budget? And that's really what, yeah. what being a, a transport coordinator comes down to. Um, it's relationships with vendors and, you know, getting to the point where you have their home numbers if you need a 84 Condor at 9 o'clock at night because they just added a new shot. I've got phone numbers for people at home, and I can call them and say, really sorry, but you really need to help mm-hmm. me. And they will, you know. So I would say, you know, if you want to do it, just learn. You know, start at the bottom. I think that the more production knowledge you have in every department, the easier it makes your job in transportation because you understand what every department's needs are. So. To wrap this all up, what would you say is the best part of your job or the worst part of your job? I think the best part for me is the overall aspect of production. I love. I love that I don't work in an office. 
I love that we're, you know, I mean, who can complain about working outdoors every day, going to different locations right. all over the city, places you probably would never see if you didn't work in this industry, um, being mm-hmm. fed two meals, sometimes three meals a day, having food out mm-hmm. all day long, meeting new people, interesting people from all over the country on every different city. I just don't know how anybody can complain about it. It just, it always has boggled my mind that, uh, yeah. that people can complain. The, the best part for me is being in charge of a department that I love and being able to treat my guys the way I feel that they should be treated. I've worked for some coordinators who aren't so nice. And my real reason for becoming a coordinator was I wanted to make sure that my drivers had a good work environment and didn't have to work, like wake up in the morning and be like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to go back there. I wanted them to look forward to coming to work. We're working together 70 hours a week. Um, I really wanted to make it like a, a, a nice family kind of home. And uh, I think that that's my favorite part. Well, Michael, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. For spending an hour talking with us. Um, we really enjoyed it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 That's it for Crew Call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the top of website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. Thank you again to Michael Parati for talking about life in the transportation department. Tune in next week for the season finale of Crew Call.